So in this third video talking about the things that I learned while playing BG3 with Larian and Ghent, I'm going to be talking about, about itemization. I've alluded to some things in the two previous videos about itemization, but it is such a huge part of Baldur's Gate 3, much more than early access would lead you to believe. And in this video, I want to talk a bit about why that is and share with you some unique items that you're going to be getting in, you know, later stages of the game so you guys can get an idea of like how they can affect your build. So in the early access portion of Baldur's Gate 3, what you can currently play if you've pre-ordered the game, you do get some uncommon rare items and maybe a couple epic items, but you don't get nearly the quantity that you'll start to see in Act 2. For instance, I think most of the gear that you'll get in early access currently are like plus one items, uh, you know, plus one weapons, plus one armor, stuff like that. And there are a couple, you know, ones with unique abilities on them, which are really cool. But for the most part, you're not finding a ton of loot that's really going to impact your build in a lot of ways. And you'll notice this changes significantly in Act 2, right? Because in Act 2, you start getting tons of this. Vendors start stocking lots of uncommon, rare, and epic items. And there's multiple vendors in each town. So sometimes you got like 20 to 30 items to choose from. And it can become really overwhelming. Like, it's not just like, oh, I need to get one cool boot for each of my characters because they this one has like nothing. It's like there's 10 to pick from and like which one do you spend your gold on and how is it going to benefit that character and do I need to like save here and buy one and go test it out and see how good it works and then come back and reload? It starts to become a huge part of the game. Going through the items and figuring out what will work for you becomes time consuming instead of just like, oh, this is uncommon. I had nothing good there. Dump it in, move on. It really takes some thought and it's going to influence your build in ways that I don't think players in early access really understand. So to give you an idea of an item that I mean in terms of the quality of these things and the way they can change your build, you have here one item called Gloves of the Growling Underdog. What this gloves does is it gives you advantage on your melee attack rolls while surrounded by two or more foes. That's huge, right? Because that almost guarantees you're going to connect on your attack. It doesn't always guarantee it, but it's going to drastically increase your chances of connecting with melee attacks while surrounded. So if you're playing a tank character or a melee character who likes to just get into the thick of it, like maybe a barbarian or a fighter, something like that, you're going to benefit from this quite often, right? And maybe you use cleave, right? Like you use cleave on all the enemies around you and boom, advantage on your cleave. So maybe you hit everything, and just do tons and tons of damage. So this is just one item, remember, like, it doesn't take a feat slot, it doesn't take particular class or race into account. You literally just get this benefit if you have this equipped, and there are a lot of equipment slots, so this is really, really strong in my opinion. And of course, it can change the way you play, right? Because maybe you're playing a melee character and your strategy has been hit and run, or maybe you don't try and get surrounded by enemies because you don't want to take damage. Well, now you're going to change your playstyle, right? Like you're trying to position your character in a way that you'll be surrounded by enemies. You'll position them on the battlefield so that enemies will move towards them. So that right there, this one item can change the way that you play your melee character. And sort of piggybacking off that, one thing that I think players are probably not taking into account enough in early access, because it's just not a huge part of early access, is armor proficiency, right? When you think of armor proficiency, typically you think of, oh, my character is a dex character, so why would he use anything beyond like light armor, right? But the gloves, the boots, all have levels of armor. They could be light armor, they could be clothing, they could be heavy armor, medium armor, and maybe that boots that you want is a medium armor piece, even though you are only using light armor on your main character's chest for like your armor class. Maybe having proficiency in medium armor so you can use some boots and gloves that really benefit your build would be good for you, even if it's not what you're wearing on your body, right? So that's something I don't think players are taking into account. And I think it's something that they'll have to think with more as they play the full version of the game and either, you know, multi-class into a martial class to pick up some proficiencies or seriously consider taking a feat that gives you an armor proficiency just in order to be able to use some of these, you know, equipment pieces that don't necessarily influence your armor class. So having talked a bit about armor, let's talk about weapons a little bit. And as you probably know, having played Early Access, most of you, that weapons have, like, weapon skills. I don't know exactly what you would call it, for lack of a better term. But, like, they can make you charge into an enemy or set bleeding or cleave enemies or pin an enemy down. A lot of these are, like, on rest abilities, right? Like, you can't use them every turn or every attack. Like, it's like a one and done. Usually you have a couple of them per weapon, and then you have to rest to get them back. Well, as you get further into the game, into Act 2, you'll start to notice that you get more of these on weapons, and also you get kind of unique ones, like, that do all kinds of crazy stuff. And and if at the very least they're not unique, they're like a smaller subset of weapons or items that have these, you know, weapon skills on them. So 
kind of makes them a little more special than the you know the regular weapons or the uncommon or rares you were finding in early access because these can be devastating so not only do you have to take into account like the damage of the weapon whether it's plus one plus two etc what its unique ability is what does it do for you but you also then have to factor in these weapon skills and what they can do in combat whether they can turn the tide for you and how many there are right because like maybe you're using a weapon that's got like four or five of these weapon skills on it now you have a lot of things you can do, even if it's just once per rest. Maybe you can do all of these once per rest. That's a lot. So there are a lot of things to consider with weapons that, again, I don't really think you see the full breadth of in early access because it's not playing too much of a role in combat. But as enemies get more challenging, as you start playing tactician mode, these things are going to come more to the forefront because they could change the course of a battle. So one of the swords that I found in Act 2 was called Soulbreaker Greatsword. And what this did was... It gave you plus two on initiative rolls, which means your turn order is going to go more often, you know, you're more likely to go first. It was also plus one, so it gave you plus one damage and plus one on your attack rolls. But also, it made it so that you dealt one to four increased psychic damage if you were a Githyanki. And this is something I mentioned in the previous video, right? Like, there are equipments in these games, particularly weapons, that benefit you more if you are of a certain race. And another weapon I found, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, I didn't write this one down, but it gave you 1 to 4 poison damage on top of its effect if you were a drow. So already I found multiple items in Act 2 that reward you for being a certain race when you use these items. And I know min-maxers out there are like, oh man, like what race do I pick now? And it will, you know, make you pause for a second during character creation because you won't know what you can get. I mean, unless you look on the wiki, which we will have all this on there at launch, you're going to run across equipment that you're going to be like, man, I wish I was blah. And again, you can't respec your race. So you're kind of stuck with, you know, either sticking it on a companion that's that race or not using it uh, or, you know, using it less effectively. So talking a little bit about legendary items, which are the highest tier of item you can get in the game. I don't know if this was revealed in the panel from hell or if anyone else has talked a bit much about legendary items, but there are nine legendary items in Baldur's Gate 3. They are extremely powerful, and they are not easy to find. And I only got to see one of them in the gameplay sessions that we had, and I didn't have a lot of time to read over it because it was kind of glanced over in a presentation, and I didn't want to pause then in the middle of this presentation to ask about it, and I forgot to ask about it later. But these are supposed to be extremely powerful items, and you might be wondering, like, well, there's 12 classes. Why are there only 9 legendary items? Well, a lot of equipment can be used between different classes, right? Like a great sword or a long sword can be used for multiple classes. So in terms of legendary items, I think the one we saw was a staff. So there are multiple classes that use staves. So you don't need to have 12 in order to make them powerful. But they're supposed to be 9, supposed to be very, very well hidden. Obviously, I want to get this onto the wiki uh, when we find these. But there are legendary items that are super strong for this game as well. So for the last part of this video, I'm just going to go through some more of these items that I found and kind of just like explain why I think they're so valuable or important to gameplay. But before I get into that exactly, one of the men items I wanted to mention that you've already seen is the Warped Headband of Intellect, right? People are wondering, is this going to make it into the full version of the game? Is it going to be in the same location? Because it's extremely strong for certain builds. And I can tell you, it is in the exact same place. It is from Fighting the Ogres in the Goblin Town area. It does exactly the same thing. So if you're somebody who wants to dump int on their like Eldritch Knight or whatever and then take this headband, this is not a bad option. Obviously, it puts you at 17 intelligence, which... Could be good or bad depending on your build but if you were wondering about that it is in the game it's in the same place and it functions exactly the same and i do want to mention that this is not the only item that does something like this in the game for instance i found gloves of dexterity which set your dexterity to 18 which is huge right that allows you to dump dexterity on maybe like i don't know a wizard or some sort of caster that has no armor but wants to get that extra armor class from dexterity you just equip these and boom you now have 18 dexterity and you get plus four armor class. So there is a lot of application for these gloves depending on what build you want to go, but that's just one item. Think about how strong that one item is. It allows you to completely dump dexterity depending on how quickly you can get this item. Obviously, maybe you struggle a little bit at the beginning of the game, but I found these items in Act 2 and not too far into Act 2. And since we know that Act 1 now is about 25% of the total game, if you find them at the beginning of Act 2, you have two-thirds or better of the game to go playing with this. That's really, really strong in my opinion. 
Another item I found that I really wanted to mention is the Vital Conduit Boots, and this makes it so when the wearer casts a spell that concentrates, they gain a temporary hit points. And I think this works really, really well for, you know, any sort of caster build or that uses concentration spells and or any sort of like hybrid build that, you know, goes into melee combat and casts concentration spells as well, particularly because of the feat that we mentioned in our last video that gives you advantage on concentration checks. So this is a really great way to gain some extra HP at, no matter what character you are. And that's just one item again. You put this one item on, you're giving yourself constantly eight extra HP, you know, for a little while while you're in combat. And it can change the way you play, right? Like now you might slot more concentration spells in order to take more advantage of this item. And another piece of equipment I found was called the Graceful Cloth. This was a clothing item you wore in your chest that had 10 armor that gave you plus two dexterity up to a maximum of 20. And that had a lot of applications for like Monk, for instance, like monks are trying to stay unarmored. This gives you more dexterity, which gives you more armor class, can also be used for your attacks, etc. So this was a really good monk item. And there was a similar item that did this with strength, which would be great for barbarian, right? Because barbarians are trying to remain unarmored in a lot of cases. And then they get the extra strength for their damage. And obviously, with these classes, if you're using like ability score improvement, you might take your ability score above 20 way later in the game. But these will remain pretty good for most builds for a big chunk of the game, right? So those are really, really strong items in just one slot, and you gain something very, very powerful. So the last item I'm going to talk a bit about is called the Deathstalker Mantle. And the reason I'm talking about it last is it sort of leads into our next video. Um, and that's because you cannot get this item unless you play as the Dark Urge. And the Dark Urge is a origin character that you can play as, but you cannot recruit, right? So there's no way to, like, get him and then get this piece of equipment that he's using you know, if you didn't pick him as your character. So you have to play as the Dark Urge to get this character. And this is such a strong item. I think a lot of players might actually just play as the Dark Urge for this one item. So first of all, you gain expertise and stealth checks by using this item, which means, I, if I'm not mistaken, that you double your proficiency bonus to stealth, which is huge. That makes you a lot stealthier as a character. But the most important part is that you turn invisible for two turns once per turn if you kill something. So you can just think what the application of that is across the board. For instance, if you make the Dark Urge a rogue and you use this, you could run in and then kill something, go invisible, and then next turn sneak attack something for huge damage, kill it, and then next turn sneak attack something for huge damage and kill it, because you basically just keep chaining invisibility. And that will protect you, give you advantage, give you sneak attack. That's huge, right? Or maybe you're a caster who is pretty squishy and you want to fling a huge spell and then you're worried you're going to get blown up. Well, maybe you kill one enemy and now you're invisible for two turns. So nothing's going to attack you on your turn and you're safe. Or, you know, maybe you're a monk or something and you're running into combat and you're kind of squishy and you want to attack and kill an enemy, but then you're worried you're going to get blown up. Well, now you don't have to worry about it as much. So there's a lot of applications with this one ability, but it's only available if you pick the Dark Urge. So I think it might make players play this and in my next video i want to talk a bit about why you might play the dark urge what and i played a lot of my whole playthrough when i was with larian was the dark urge and kind of talk a bit about why i think people are kind of underestimating the dark urge and why it's such an interesting storyline so we'll talk about that in the next video so what do you guys think about the itemization that give you guys enough examples to kind of get you more interested again the amount of loot that you get is probably double or triple that you see in Act 1, and I think it only ramps up from there. So eventually, your whole inventory is just going to be full of these different items, and part of your build is mixing and matching them and finding the best combinations of them for your class. If you multi-class, your subclass, what, you know, synergies does it have with the spells that you're using might change the spells you select in order to, you know, deal extra fire damage or stuff like that. So there is a lot to think with, and itemization, I think, is what really propels Baldur's Gate 3's customization of your character up and above other RPGs.